Hi everyone, thanks again for joining us uh, in this uh, video interviews with uh, people affected. Um, we are today speaking with uh, Charles Stewart from England, UK. Hi Charles, how are you doing today? Hello there, yes, very well, thank you. And thank you for inviting me to come and chat with you. Yeah, it's great to have you joining us. So maybe first of all, who is, who is Charles and, and what's your personal connection with, with epilepsy? Yeah, so my uh, <clears throat> my involvement with epilepsy is is um, it's from from two aspects really um, professionally and also family. Um, a little bit about me uh, professionally. So I have worked on the human genome for uh, around twenty six and a half years um, at the Wellcome Sanger Institute uh, near Cambridge for twenty two of those years, and then. Uh, for four of those years, uh, a company called Congenica, who's a, a, a digital health company that investigates the genomic uh, basis for rare disease. And of course, many of those diseases would involve epilepsy. Um, <clears throat> and I was really very ignorant about epilepsy up until the point my daughter, who was born uh, a month premature, spent her first month in hospital in intensive care. Um, she seemed to be developing fine for the first eight months of her life. Um, and then she started, uh, we, we knew there was something not right with her because she stopped laughing, smiling, interacting with her surroundings. You know, she always had this sort of blindness across her. She just wouldn't recognize things. Um, and after that, a period of sort of a few weeks of that, she developed these um, jerks, these sort of her hands would come out, her head would turn, and her knees would come up to her chest. And we were really, <clears throat> we knew there was something terribly wrong. And in fact, we'd been taking her to the doctors to say, look, help, something's wrong, we don't know what it is. Um, and the doctor actually thought she had a gastrointestinal problem, something like reflux, and, and gave her something called Gaviscon, which is something to help uh, settle the acid in the stomach, I believe. But anyway, once she started making these um, <clears throat> very violent um, movements, we filmed them and then immediately took her to accident and emergency because this was clearly something very, very serious. And it was at hospital uh, where she had her EEG, um, mm -hmm. which measures the brain activity um, to look to see if there's anything abnormal in the brain. Um, and together with the video we had made of uh, Imogen's seizures and also the fact that the clinician had seen that she had regressed in her, her development, you know, she wasn't hitting the milestones, uh, he was able to diagnose her with a type of epilepsy called West Syndrome, which is also called infantile spasms. And West Syndrome is one of the very, <clears throat> one of the most catastrophic forms of, uh, of epilepsy. Um, and in the most severe cases, the seizures can actually cause death. Um, and <clears throat> West Syndrome it seems to be one of sort of three epilepsies that are considered to be almost like a group. Um, Otohara Syndrome, which uh, comes on at birth, or actually, according to some uh, mothers who's, who have children with Otohara Syndrome, they believe the child may even have been seizing within the womb. And children with Otohara syndrome sometimes go on to develop West syndrome. And then the third se uh, severe type of epilepsy is something called uh, Lennox-Gastel syndrome, which, which tends to come on later in life. So the, the, the three sort of come on at, at birth after about eight months and then sort of two years afterwards. Um, and the, the, the worry we had was that uh, children with West syndrome do often uh, tend to go on and develop uh, Lennox-Gastel syndrome. And so this has always been a, a, a worry for us about our daughter. Thankfully, so far, um, she's okay. Uh, and in fact, <clears throat> she was entered onto a, a clinical trial um, at Addenbrooke's Hospital in Cambridge, uh, England, uh, called the ICIS study. Um, and that involved giving her two different types of medication. One was an anti-convulsant called vigabatrin and the other one was uh, a steroid called prednisolone and the combination of the two actually stopped her seizures within 24 hours which meant that she was able to start developing again 
not developing normally, but at least beginning to uh, develop again. So th th this was this was fantastic, and mm -hmm. I just have to say, you know, we're really really lucky in this part of England to have uh, <clears throat> a world famous hospital such as Addenbrooke's, which. Uh, you know, they understand these disorders perhaps more so than so, some of the other um, uh, hospitals around the country. All right. So maybe you can also tell a little bit about your your journey up to getting that that diagnosis of of West syndrome or infantile spasms. Like, um, yeah, how long did it take before you were able to get that diagnosis? And yeah, what were the obstacles yeah. in your in your way to to get that? Uh, what well, as yeah, as I say, the um, so <clears throat> I, I suppose the first thing, and I, and I alluded to this, um, what I've just said, is that when we suspected something was wrong with our child, and of course, you know, we were first time parents, and we had no benchmark against which to compare our child, but I think instinctively, you know, there's something wrong. And the first problem we had was when we went to our general practitioner, um, they just had absolutely, they'd never seen this before, you know, and that's no criticism of the doctor. It, it, it's just that, you know, with these types of epilepsy, they are so rare that a general practitioner is, it may never ever come across something during, uh, during their practice. So that was the first problem we had was that the general practitioners just didn't have the awareness that this could be um, a cause of uh, Imogen, my, my daughter's, um, problems. Mm -hmm. um, but then I, I suppose we were very lucky that the clinician we spoke to at, at hospital when we took her into action, accident emergency, you know, he was actively involved in this clinical trial investigating West syndrome. And it was thanks to his you know, really fast intervention. And he even said to us at hospital, he said, you're not going home until I have the medication for you. Um, it, we were really, really lucky that, that that part was just unbelievably swift. And that, that, that may well have saved her life. You know, we don't know. But of course, <clears throat> knowing other families who've, who've, who've gone through all these sorts of trials and tribulations of, of not knowing, of perhaps the clinicians not knowing what it was they were dealing with and what have you, <clears throat> you know, they're, yeah, absolutely. In those cases, you know, the child has um, gone on to, to do very, very poorly. So, because mm -hmm. time really matters with these kind of, of rare uh, conditions or, or rare epilepsies, especially those with an early onset like West syndrome. So, yeah. you need a first few months, can, yeah, the earlier that you can, how to say, do something with the seizure activity. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the, the better for the development of the child, etc. Um, yeah. So, um, where are you guys today, and and what are your hopes for the for the future ahead? Do you mean where are we physically, or where are we on our on our journey as parents? On your on your journey, maybe uh, epilepsy journey. Yeah. Um, um, so, uh, well, <clears throat> so um, since Imogen's West syndrome uh, was resolved through the medication. Um, she was then subsequently diagnosed with uh, severe cerebral palsy. So cerebral palsy is ranked from one to five, with one the, the least severe and five the most severe. And Imogen is a grade four, which means that she can't walk or she can't even stand on her own. So really that has been the biggest challenge to us, um, having to adapt our house so that she can live downstairs, um, having to get a of a, a vehicle that can transport her wheelchairs around. And thankfully, she's only had one major seizure in that time. So she's now seven. Um, she had a very severe uh, seizure when she was two, two years old. Um, and that, ironically, is around the time that this other severe type of epilepsy comes on called lennox gashdow syndrome. And instantly, we were really, really worried that that could have been um, what we were seeing, her, her, the seizure. But thankfully, it wasn't. Um, so Imogen was enrolled into uh, a genome study. Uh, first of all, she was uh, enrolled into something called De uh, Deciphering Developmental Disorders, which is oh, sorry, which is was a study, I mean, which now closed to recruitment, um, that looked at uh, mum, dad, and the child. So a, what we call a trio um, for around, uh, I, I believe, sort of 
14,000 uh, families in the UK. Um, and that didn't find anything. I mean, the whole point of using a, um, the, what we call a trio analysis is that we know that neuro, a lot of neurodevelopmental disorders, particularly epilepsy, are as a result of what we call a de novo mutation, a new mutation. So a mutation that arises in the child that's not in mum and dad. So you're specifically looking for those types of mutations because of the fact they're so heavily involved with um, epilepsy. So if you take mum's sequence and dad's sequence and then compare the child's sequence, if you find um, part of the sequence in the child that's not in mum and dad, that makes you very suspicious as it could be the, uh, could be the cause of whatever disorder you're looking at. Anyway, so she was entered into that. That didn't find anything um, because it was only looking at specific parts of the genome. And as a result, our clinician said, well, why don't we enroll you into the uh, <clears throat> 100,000 genomes uh, project in, in, in the UK? And, and this is exactly what it is. It's, it, it's a, a study that looks at rare diseases and cancers in sort of 100,000 people. And this is an ongoing project. Um, that there's some there's some great results coming out of it, but unfortunately, not results for us yet. Um, okay. We've we've had a negative diagnosis so far, which is you know it, it's a shame in a way. I mean, it's a relief to know that what Imogen has is not one of those really severe disorders that clinicians already know about. But it does, of course, mean well. What was the cause of um, her epilepsy? Mm -hmm. So um, we had our result through on the exact, it, it was one minute before we went in to have the 12 week scan for our little boy Jasper. Um, so we were kind of relieved and I say kind of um, a bit disappointed. Um, and unfortunately Jasper was born two months prematurely and spent uh, obviously two, two, two months in intensive care. And it was as we were leaving, <clears throat> the last couple of days we were in uh, intensive care um, the clinician who, who oversees intensive care um, at Addenbrooke's in Cambridge came to speak to us and said that they were very worried about Jasper because um, he'd suffered severe brain damage during birth um, and they'd only seen this on his final ultrasound scan of his brain. And unfortunately, it takes around two months for um, the damage to appear on the ultrasound. So what had happened is he'd been starved of oxygen during birth parts of his brain had died um, and during that process of dying they had turned to liquid and left these cysts these holes in his brain uh, which then filled back up with liquid and it's only possible to see that once this whole uh, mechanism has uh, had occurred so jasper was then enrolled into another genome study this is a very fast turnaround study at cambridge university which which goes from which from taking the blood of the child to actually deliver, uh, getting a report takes around two to three weeks, which is really, really fast. You know, the 100,000 genomes is, is a matter of years, and the DDD study was a sort of a similar amount of time. I think, but we mm, I think when, when people are thinking about genomes and, and these things, they are very often thinking about labs and, and researchers. Um, can you maybe explain a bit how, what's the difference then in regards to the more like the clinical genomics and how it's applied to, to yeah, the way doctors are, are diagnosing and treating patients? Um, sorry, sorry, do you mean in the sense that there is the research study and, and, a, and a clinical study? What, what, what are the two differences? Yeah, and, and of course, the, the speed towards how it can give answers immediately to, to people. Yeah, so, I mean, a lot of studies are, are research studies and um, actually getting I, I think sort of getting a, a clinical grade genome studies is is, is still an ongoing thing um, <clears throat> but certainly in the UK we are rapidly integrating um, genomic medicine into into everyday healthcare I mean it's, it's not there yet but it, you know it really is um, um, very much an option for a clinician to to go for when, when they're dealing with a, a, a sick child and you think so well, what is the so what is the purpose and what, what is the point in um, 
going through a genome study if you're if if you have epilepsy if you have a, a sick child with a nasty neurodevelopmental disorder because a lot of clinicians and even families still think well there's nothing we can do even if we do have a, a result you know that's it well that's mm. just not true um of course in many cases you know we don't yet have therapy that's based specifically upon um a, a, a certain mutation that's occurred in in the patient but um there are examples of certain epilepsies that that can be targeted with specific drugs if you know what the underlying cause is and also uh, you know a, a, a genomic result will help um in many other ways it, it may inform as to whether if you have another child that child will also have the same disorder or whether the chances of that of, of, a, of a second child having it are very very small likewise it can uh, it can be psychologically important because um often parents worry that it's something that they have done during birth to cause uh, their, their, their child's epilepsy whereas if you understand that it was just one of those accidents of, of nature you know you mm -hmm. can begin to sort of to uh, to move ahead and also you know if you get a, a label for your disorder it helps um open up access to specific services that uh, that, that, that may be uh, able to provide for you um and in the future of course you know as we all hope um understanding your genetic disorder will open up the possibility of having gene specific therapy you know we're a bit of a way from that now but you know that is that is the goal and it's not an unreasonable goal <laughs> What's your um, advice to families who are in a very early phase of, of having received, for example, the diagnosis of, of rare epilepsy? That's a that's a very difficult <clears throat> uh, that's a very difficult question to answer, really, because inevitably um, this is a life changing moment. Um, finding out that your child has a very severe uh, epilepsy. Um, and it was for us, and it, it, it took a long time for us to actually begin to um, adapt and I wouldn't say have a normal family life, but begin to sort of do the normal things that a family will do. But, you know, you do, it's funny how you adapt and it, you, it, life does actually get better, um, you know, with, with, with these terrible things. And what I would recommend certainly is, you know, reach out to those Facebook groups uh, those social media groups where other families with the same disorder um, um, are there to support you and it's amazing the uh, support you can take from each uh, the strength you can take from each other um, because you begin to realize you're not just there on your own you know 20 years ago before we had Facebook and Twitter and all that sort of stuff you were given a diagnosis of a very rare epilepsy and that was it you were on your own you were living your life on your own not having any idea as to how to cope but now you know the internet's a wonderful thing in, in some respects um in that you can contact other people and you'll find that you know you are so welcome when you uh, you contact these people and you can bring about change you know you really can bring about change the patient voice is unbelievably powerful and <clears throat> if you look um a, 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 as i do i i've, I've been working closely with uh, patient advocacy groups you know the the strength of the argument that you can bring about to, um, to pharma companies and genomic companies to champion your disease is really seeing amazing results for uh, these really rare diseases. So if you get together, you club together with other people, you can take strength from each other, but also drive the process of uh, looking for therapies for the, these disorders. Wow, that's very uh, that's a very nice way to end this, this conversation. Um, definitely um getting those those answers is, is so important also for the community uh, of, of our uh, epi hunter community and obviously um the worries for for what's the unknown and getting though though a diagnosis of course also starts another train of thoughts and concerns it definitely is is helping them when they are coming together with with other families and, and understanding yeah. that they are not alone in this even though yes indeed some of these conditions like west syndrome uh, have only a few hundred families um 
diagnosed um, maybe on a yearly basis or so. So it's it's really um, yeah, it's not many maybe, but once you come together, it's definitely uh, very very powerful. Um, thank you so much, Charles, for joining us today um, for this conversation about epilepsy and its impact on daily life, and also for giving us more insights in how to genomics can help in, in, in both in the diagnosing the, these kind of epilepsies, but also, yeah, um, enhancing the care pathway and, and finding, yeah, foster the, the right treatments to, to deal with it. So thank you again so much for joining us and uh, I wish you all the best. And thank you uh, again for inviting me.